everyone. Welcome to the Sunday Weekly Warm Up. My name is Ray Hewitt. Of course, we have Brad Hughes here with us, and it is just the two of us today. We have a lot in store as far as catching up. I want to ask Brad like 300 questions because I have a lot going on in my life that I appreciate Brad's opinion on. And then to be honest, during our Sunday strategy segment, we went through a number of different listener questions kind of created a little activity for us to do. So if you're just jumping in as we are streaming exclusive in the private Facebook group for the Teach Better team over at teachbettergroup.com, we'd love to hear from you, where you're listening from. We went live a little early. We'd love to hear about your weekend, kind of all that jazz, warm up the comments because we are going to ask for a lot of participation today. And then if you're catching this after the fact, after our Sunday live stream, um, we'd also love to hear from you. Obviously, Having you in the comments when we're live on Sunday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern is always fun because we get to engage with you and actually see your comments live and be here in community. But if you're catching this after the fact, I promise there'll be a lot of value for you to consider. And when I say value, I really just mean that Brad Hughes is here. And so good luck. Uh, If you have friends in this group, other teacher friends that you want to tag while you're watching, that would be awesome. The more the merrier is invited to our Sunday weekly warm up. Good afternoon. Good evening. Happy Sunday, Brad. How are you? Good afternoon. Good evening. Happy Sunday. I'm doing really well. I'm in Ray. I'm I'm in the Sunday weekly warm up space with my good friend and colleague Ray Heward. I actually, there's no place I'd rather be. Uh, no time I'd rather be meeting than right now, uh, Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern, each and every week, live streaming exclusively in our Teach Better Facebook group and. If you're happy to join us later, maybe it's on an episode of the Teach Better Talk podcast. Maybe you're joining us on one of our live streams and on one of our socials. We're just excited that you're here. So let us know who you are, where you are, where are you joining us from. Please make sure you hit us up on those comments. We love our little community here, friends. We want you to be active in it. You know, there's a lot of different accounts, whether you, you know, are used to Facebook or used to other social medias that you might just linger and follow. I actually have an Instagram account for like professional use. And then within the last year or so, I created like an incognito, like my own perfect, like non-professional account that I just lurk and watch people. And I, you know, Brad, I follow kind of all the other stuff I like about education, right? Like art and, and, you know, I don't know, influencers that sell me products I don't need. And that's great. I think that there's a space for both of those, but here in the Teach Better family, we want you to be active. We want to hear from you, even if it's just posting an emoji. We don't want you to have to put in a lot of effort, just like a smidge, just a little to be like, I'm alive. Hey, friends. <laughs> well, let's face it. It's your Sunday night, folks. So however you're joining us, if you're joining us live, whether you're joining us, just kind of you're kind of listening in the background. Uh, Ray and I are going to sort of soothe you into a relaxing and upbeat Sunday evening. Or maybe you want to join us actively and ask us questions. You want to let us know what's on your mind what important things you have in store for you in your weekend education, no matter what it is, we want to hear from you. And by all means, if you're joining us live on Facebook, remember to grant StreamYard permission to see your name. There's a little link in a little window that says grant StreamYard permission to see your name because then we can put a face to the name. We know who's joining us and we're we're eager to have all guests, but but mystery guests are, well, let's face it, they're a mystery race. So it's nice to know who we're talking with. And I, I feel like, Brad, we do a lot on the team to at least strive to get to know the people in our community. So it's more fun when we can say hi to like Janelle and actually ask how you are and like get an authentic conversation going. I know Janelle is one of the many in our Teach Better family that participates so often. Brian also does as well. I'm you dying know. to have Can- Can- um, Candice jump in because I have been following her puppy's journey through uh, a recent health scare and I have Mm. lots of questions and this could be a time for us all to catch up. So also, Brad, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be we're going to be doing an activity in our next segment when we're ready for it that requires people to just make up an opinion and simply put in a number stating that opinion. And I really think this will be an easy way for us to be actively engaged in kind of a silly way, but still have some fruitful conversation. So fingers crossed, it'll be fun. 
Ray, what I need to do is find a way to divide our Sunday weekly warm up space, our studio space here into into four corners. In some of our classrooms, we have four corners set up, and in each corner, there's a I guess a re response to an opinion. So it could be agree, strongly agree, disagree, or strongly disagree. And if everyone watching and listening, just be prepared to go to whatever corner you need to. Just physically move yourself to that corner, and of course, Ray and I can see where you are and what you're doing. And uh, I'm not sure if you can figure out a way to add those four corners to our space, Ray, I'd love to hear from you quick. Well, that's actually, that's actually the annoying part, Brad, of having to host the Sunday weekly warm up with you, because I did not, I did not tell you the activity. And yet that is very, very close to literally what we're doing. So you frustrate me in that way, Brad, that you know me so well. And yet somehow just read my mind. But yes, we are literally doing that type of activity. You get to make up whatever response you want. Brad and I will debate your answers. So make sure you stick with us for our Sunday strategy section coming up here in a bit. Brad, before we get to that, can we just catch up? Like, how was your weekend? How are things? How's life? Life is good. Yeah, a good weekend. Uh, my daughter, Megan, was participating in uh, intercollegiate acapella competition last night uh, at the University of Waterloo. Their uh, quarterfinals and there were quarterfinals held all over uh, the Eastern region uh, last night and this weekend. Uh, Megan was performing in two a cappella groups, and there were 10 groups in all. Uh, Megan's uh, Megan's groups did not make uh, the top 10, so they advanced two out of the 10 to the semifinals that are going to be held at the University of Buffalo in New York uh, in March. But incredible performances and incredible celebration of you know the art of a cappella. Not easy to pull off, and they had uh, not only the, the 10 groups from the different uh, varsity groups, uh, uh, collegiate groups, both in the, in Canada and the U S but they had a barbershop quartet to just it, incredible student talent on display this weekend here in, uh, in, uh, Southern Ontario, right. And how was your weekend? Oh my gosh. I will tell you, but first I'm going to challenge our community here getting us started friends, put one emoji. If you can, if you want to pick a few, no shame, it's fine. It's Sunday, do whatever you want. Pick one emoji that describes what you did in like in high school or college as like your activity. Cause mm. when I hear acapella group, I go back to like high school days. I was very like a theater nerd. I was in choir. I would totally, I'm, your, your daughter sounds amazing. So I would love to see in the comments what people maybe here in our community kind of picked as their middle school, high school, college, you know, sport or hobby that they chose to participate in. In the meantime, Brad, I spent a ton of time this weekend working on my 2024 goals. And for some people, you might like roll your eyes back, like, ugh, not these goals again. But no, no, no. I have like hobby goals. And I worked on only my hobby goals this weekend. I worked on my piano earlier today. Brad, oh. really quick. Do you play any instruments? I can strum a guitar uh, oh. and I can uh, play some melodies on clarinet. But I, 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 I do neither of them regularly, Ray. But uh, Give me a, kid, a guitar and a campfire or a, a clarinet and a little bit of simple sheet music and I can pull that off. Done. Somebody write that down. Brad, I have signed you up for Teach Better, like around the bonfire. We're figuring oh, out yeah. how to do that. I love that. My piano will be useless there, but I know a little, I can do a little ditty on the piano if we're ever in an elegant, you know, mall where I can <laughs> grab the piano. Oh, absolutely. We can, we can make sure that we have a uh, rechargeable keyboard and you can uh you can regale us the keyboard and honestly i'm i am a virtuoso at the kazoo ray i mean my kazoo skills are unmatched uh and uh you know around the campfire between your keyboard and my kazoo i think we'll keep we'll keep everyone entertained <laughs> probably <laughs> probably there'll be a lot of laughs at the same I love, time i love that i'm seeing a lot of music notes in the comments yeah, so far so with the get together everyone here just bring your instrument and someone tag you know, if you've been in the Teach Better family, help me out. Someone tag Dennis Sheeran. He needs mm -hmm. to bring his saxophone. Right. So somebody like at Dennis Sheeran, he must be in this group or something. Pull him in here. We, we need him. Um, the other thing I did, so piano's on my 2024 goals. So I was yeah. working on that for a little today. Um, really, I'm like trying to work on like being calm. I get very stressed at the piano, not knowing the notes. Yeah. Um, okay. The other thing is I wanted to learn a language. I started with French which I thought would be really good because you speak French and we could have done a little bit of French back and forth on the Sunday weekly warm up, right? We could. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, I was trying to encourage other people in my world to do a language so that we could practice together. 
and I got outvoted. So I switched to Spanish, which actually is really good because I think I'll have more opportunity outside of just you, Brad, to converse. Mm -hmm. Um, but I've been working on Spanish a lot today. So if anyone here speaks other languages, I would really love to know who I can kind of like tap into to be like, to habla espanol, you know, like try and get, try and get a little practice in, but Brad, you used to teach language, didn't you? I did, Ray. I was a French language teacher for 16 years. Uh, I began teaching kids as young as five years old to speak French. Uh, and as I graduated up in my teaching experience, my students also got older. So I was assigned primary uh, grades and then junior grades, uh, which in Ontario is grades four to six. And then I finished my career uh, teaching uh, seventh and eighth grade uh, French, as well as visual arts and special education. A little bit of vocal music, too, a little bit. A little bit of a Swiss Army knife of, of educators by the time I finished my career. But uh, teaching French was uh, a passion and uh, I just loved it. Loved getting kids engaged not only with the language learning, but in the aspects of the culture. And above all, when you're learning a language, there's the opportunity to celebrate the mistakes that you make. You're failing forward all the time. And hopefully with uh, great language teachers, whether it's Duolingo or someone in your classroom, you're getting positive feedback about your efforts. And that's an effort and an enjoyment is going to move you forward in your language learning experience. Oh, it's so cool. Brad, I just think this is, again, for all of you that are here with us, this is why I literally think that Brad is the coolest dude ever. Like you just are, Brad. You're so well-versed. I always learn something new about you. And I love that you have such a such an interesting background in education, then turned administrator. I have to tell you, one of my favorite administrators I ever worked for was an art teacher prior mm -hmm. to being an administrator. And I always thought that was so weird. I'm like, art teachers can become administrators? And yet- Hold on. We not only have Brad Hughes in the mm -hmm. arts moving to administration, but Joshua double underscore stamper went from the arts into administration. I think you're a very special breed. I have a very special place in my heart for those administrators that, that have gone that route. So kind and so true. I mean, Joshua, one of our closest friends and uh, loved uh, beloved colleagues here on the Teach Better team. Uh, both of us have uh, backgrounds in the creative arts and visual arts and uh, leveraging whatever experience we have in our teaching journeys it really is all about the people and the relationships and also recognizing as school leaders that it, it may be important if not essential to have a wide range of uh, background knowledge in terms of curriculum in terms of, in terms of student behavior motivating staff moving schools forward but each of us no matter what our journey has been has something to offer as long as we're committed to building up the relationships among the adults that serve the kids Mm, I love it. I know we want to go to our Sunday strategies, but Brad, before we go, can we just talk a little bit about the bingo card that you and I and a lot of the Teach Better team members have created um, to kind of track and make it a little bit more fun to have our 2024 goals? We may have mentioned it on the show, but because we have such uh, active community here, I just want to make sure that the invitation for them to participate is also here. So love do you it. want to kick off that conversation? 100%. And uh, here inside the Teach Better team, we, we're we posting our goals on bingo cards. And so we've been found, found a way to gamify our 2024 goals. And as we reach those goals, whether they're uh, personal, professional, whether they're you know little steps along the way or whether they're major milestones, we just find a way to celebrate it. I, I'm curious who among us is going to be the first to get the five in a row. I've already got my free space filled in the middle, so you know, Ray. You've got your free space filled in too. And I'm wondering if if, if Spanish is now part of your bingo card. It, it Spanish is, I think my bingo card originally said French, but I'm switching it to Spanish because I have a community that's committed over five people that we're working on this together. So I feel very like that's, that's the right way to go. Pianos on there. Um, posting on Instagram for a consistent basis is on there. I'm really trying to hold myself accountable, but other things on there, Brad, are goals that I want to support other people in doing. And I really love the variety of creating this on a bingo card. All of you are welcome to participate. Just get like, you know, just get a piece of paper, make a few boxes and join in. I'm keeping mine next to my bed. Um, Brad, I feel like this would be really good also like on the refrigerator, you know, like just to have it somewhere in the house. But you already have the free space and another one crossed out. So you're on a roll. I sure do. And uh in the next two weeks, uh, my Teach Better family is going to see uh, another couple of spots filled up. I know that uh, Brianne Fellow has, uh, Fennel has filled up two of her spots as well. But what a cool way not only to, to share and celebrate your goals, but to keep yourself and others in your team motivated. I, I just love the team bingo that uh, the Teach Better has created. And there's an example of the Teach Better bingo card right on your screen right now. Yeah, I encourage all of you to check that out. And if if you want to do this with your team teachers that you work with or your leadership team, I don't know, just find a way to make it fun. 
to me, while there's so many good goals for us to set, this was just a really easy reminder and we gave a little game out of it. So we're going to transition here into our Sunday strategies. Again, if you want to participate in the bingo card, like jump in. We'd love to have you. We're all going to be posting our bingo cards for the next few months. And who knows if we fill it up and get bingo, we might have to go for a blackout and get the whole thing fin oh, like yeah. finalized before the end of the year, which of course would be like the perfect thing ever. But mm -hmm. um, Brad, I have a little activity and I am very excited for our community here to participate. It will be very easy for you all to participate. You just are going to pick random numbers. Brad and I are going to be here to support you. And this is completely off of the listener questions that you mm -hmm. all submitted. So we'll be right back. with us for our Sunday weekly warm up. Brad Hughes and I are excited to dive into an activity that really gets us thinking about education. This was sparked from having almost too many listener questions, Brad. We have so many listener questions that we have not gotten to. Obviously, we're using this bank of questions not only for the Sunday weekly warm up, but for our today morning show. And I wanted us to discuss a few different things to support our community. So I, I made a little activity for us to do. Are you up for participating? Absolutely. It, it's, it's incredible to have so many listener questions. We've got tons of engagement here in our uh, evening show tonight, Ray, in the comments. And it's engagement that really keeps us fueled and excited to connect and to reconnect week after week. So I'm excited to dig into whatever listener questions we have in store. I love it. So here's the rules. The rules are we are going to have a scale one to 10. Okay. And Brad, this scale of one to 10 was completely inspired by a story my father told me. It doesn't really much matter what scale you use. We're going to use one to 10 just because of that. And mm -hmm. this was actually something that he tried to instill in me when I was trying to foster a relationship, whether it be a friendship or a partnership. But yeah. I think it really works well here. The only thing we need to decide is, is which is more important? Is it better if something's really important to you for it to be like a 10 out of 10? Or if it's really important to you, should be like the number one thing? I think one is lowest, I guess, lowest priority, lowest emphasis, and 10 is the highest. That's that's what makes most, most sense to me. Okay, so that is something we all have to agree on. If all of you are good with that, you can put a thumbs up or some like emojis that will really help us. That means that when we discuss something, if it's really, really important to you, it's a 10. If it really doesn't matter to you at all, you could care less, it's a one. Hmm. So that's going to be the only thing that we all have to agree on. So Brad, I have cu uh, curated about 40 different statements. We don't have to go through all of them. And what we're going to discuss is I'm one of us is going to read a sentence. I gave I gave you the list. So we're going to go back and forth yep. and we are going to each other ask each other how important this one statement is as far as education. And we can kind of have some conversation. Maybe it depends. Maybe there's some context. We're going to ask for our community here to also post their numbers. So, again, Beautiful. if it's very important, like the main thing that you have to focus on in education you agree with. It should be a 10. If it's something that you're like, eh, could go or co, who cares? It's going to be a one. The problem is, friends, there are 40 things. And not all 40 things can be 10s, right? Like that's the problem in education is that we feel as though we have so many things to juggle because they're all important. Brad, are you up for this challenge? I'm ready. I'm going to be honest, Ray. I, I think it's going to be hard for me not to rate everything as a 10. So I, I, I need you to hold me accountable here. And I'm looking forward to seeing how our perspectives line up and how the perspectives of our viewers and listeners line up too. We would love to hear how you feel in the comments. If you want to just chime in with your number from one to 10, or if you want to elaborate on why you think it is that rating, we'd love to hear from you. Well, and I think it's going to matter. It's going to be what type of leadership are you working for? What type of teach, what kind of teacher are you? What kind of students do you have? What kind of year has it been? Like these are all factors. So there are really no wrong answers. We know all 40 of these things are perfect in an ideal world for an educator to do. 
but what is the most important? So Brad, (laughs) we're going to start off with a hard one. So I'm going to ask you, and then you'll, I'll start with number one. You start okay with number reading number two after. Uh huh. All right. Number one, Brad, is this a one or a 10 or anything in between fostering a positive and inclusive learning environment? Uh, for me, that's a 10 out of 10. I mean, that's uh, that's that's the reason why we do what we do. It's to give kids and, and families and all stakeholders a reason to get excited about coming into our spaces and and leave feeling glad they came, that they were, you know, uh, that they were engaged, that there was a sense of belonging, that, you know, d- developing true community. I, what do you think, Ray? Uh, and for, I agree. I feel like this is, if no other 10s, this has to be a 10, right? I feel like this is the baseline level of, the, of what has to happen in a classroom. If no learning happens, at least this exists. I'm seeing a lot of tens in the comments as well. Brad, you want to start us off with the next one? Absolutely. Number two, establish clear expectations for behavior and academic performance, right? See, I feel like this is a trick question because establishing clear expectations for behavior and academic performance to me helps you have a positive and inclusive learning environment. However, I will say establish clear expectations for behavior to me is really, really high for academic performance. I could be like, yes, that also is true, but it's not as strong for me. I'm going to go like seven because I try not to go 10. I'm really trying. Everyone in the comment went 10. Brad. 10. It's, it's all a 10. <laughs> this can't all be 10s. I'm going seven, Brad. And I think it's a low ball, but I'm trying to get some variety. Ray, I'm going to go along with your seven. And I, I'm going to actually raise the stakes if I'm not hedging my best a little bit too. It, it's not only establishing the uh, the expectations for behavior and academic performance, but it, it, it's maintaining them. It's nurturing them. Ooh. When there are setbacks, it's identifying where we fell short and how to help ourselves, our colleagues, and our kids bridge the gap. So I think that it's a a seven to start. And then, but what is a 10 is maintaining and nurturing and, and, and bringing into, I guess, bringing into reality, those expectations and and naming them and celebrating them. Well, to me, establishing actually isn't important at all. If we're not talking about maintaining them, like establishing it, like you do at the beginning of the year, you tell people and then move on. That could be a two. If you don't maintain it to me, this doesn't matter. This is a, like, that's really important to me. A hundred percent. You, you can set it matter. up. You can set that as the foundation, but if there is no uh, accountability in terms of nurturing it and, and holding ourselves and students to account where we fall short or where we uh, succeed and achieve, then we've lost all credibility. Oh, interesting. All right. Number three, you guys sticking with us? I told you it was going to be hard. Okay, this is great. Create engaging and interactive lessons. Uh, I'm going to say eight. Uh, and I, uh, eight is where I'm going to land there. What do you think, Ray? Wait, I want to know your why, because I was going to really lowball this one to be completely yeah. frank with you. Uh, okay. Now I I'm thinking eight because, uh, without that sense of engagement, without that sense of, uh, aha for our students and for ourselves, I mean, we want to engage ourselves as well of our students. I mean, moment to moment, that engagement could take some, you know, some peaks and valleys. It doesn't have to be sort of a three ring circus birthday party kind of uh, festival affair all the time. But engagement also means we're drawing on uh, each student's uh, particular skills, strengths, interests, and identity in, in what we put forward. All right, Brad, I agree with you. I, I couldn't agree more with everything you said. However, create engaging and interactive lessons to me I might be able to lowball that one and still keep my students working hard because I'm fostering a positive relationship. So I'm thinking I'm going to go like five. Like to me, if you have these strong baselines, that's then the next thing you should work on. But if you don't have those strong baselines, like I wouldn't even care about that yet. I I don't know. It feels icky because you know, I love a good engaging dynamic lesson. (laughs) One of our viewers said that you're going to say fluff ain't enough. Is that a connection with the, with uh, your low ball uh, rating of the engagement there? I mean, fluff ain't enough is a huge part of like, I used to say that all the time. Alex always is the one that quotes me for that. So I don't know if that's what Alex Facebook user says, but that's my issue is like fluff ain't enough means that it has to be more than just the, the color and the flair. But if you haven't even like set an engaging and if you haven't even set a safe space to learn, then I don't care what your lessons are. I don't know that this is going to be really hard and we're only on number three. <laughs> yeah. 
I think they're all tens. They're all tens, right? No, they can't be all tens. All right, Brad, we're going to go through at least like six of these. And then we're going to pick random numbers because I do want to know. I mean, we have 40 of these. So we can even ask our viewers to give us uh, numbers on the list eventually. But let's read number four. Is it your turn or my turn? I don't remember. It's my turn. And number four, Ray, is provide timely and constructive feedback to students. To me, this is a 10. To me, here's my argument. Yep. I think that we have not done a good enough job in this field valuing feedback. I actually think that almost nothing else matters if you're not giving that authentic, timely feedback. And your lessons can be god awful, but they can still impact learning if you give that timely feedback. So a huge sticking point for me, especially 2024, but especially last year was focused on I want to help educators figure out how to give timely feedback without having the stress that these like traditional like ways of communicating with students make us do. Like feedback used to take us ages. Now there are ways, progressive ways to give this in a way that changes the game for learning. So to me, this this is my 10. This is the rock I'll die on. Where do you see the biggest gap, Ray, between the kinds of feedback that we normally or typically would give students or that I guess that students would expect to receive and your highest aspiration for the kind of feedback that's provided? I think the biggest issue is the structure of learning. I think when we do, when the mindset is, and again, I know I'm not knocking how we teach. I just want to improve it. The concept of I'm going to stand here and communicate to you then you are going to engage with the learning in some way, shape, or form for a timed period of time. And then I'm going to check for understanding as you leave the door does not allow for timely feedback. Like it's not the teacher's fault that timely feedback doesn't happen when our lessons are structured that way. So I am I think it's really about changing our mindset for lesson planning more than anything else, because I've never met a teacher that doesn't want to talk to their students, doesn't want to be a cheerleader and give them feedback for more effective learning. It's usually just, I want to, but I can't figure out how to get to it in a consistent way. And that stress, I I, I feel that. We got, we got to give them solutions. One of the gifts that I had as a visual arts teacher uh, when we had studio lessons was the opportunity to circulate and yeah. to give kids moment-to-moment -moment feedback on not only what they were doing, how they were doing, but how they were approaching a creative problem, which is really what I tried to do as a studio art teacher was to bake the feedback in, a constant source of feedback and a constant source, not only of feedback from me to the student, but but more of a dialogue about how the students were opening up their skills, how they were achieving what they want to achieve. And so it doesn't have to be sage on the stage providing feedback. It can also be teacher to student, student to teacher, problem solving conversation, uh, and one of our guests or one of our uh, viewers tonight says the feedback does not have to be written on a piece of paper for it to be valuable, but it does Amen. have to be purposeful and it has to be baked into the process. So students see and feel and engage with feedback as a positive reinforcing process throughout any learning process. I will have to say, Brad, I think something that so resonates with me with the way I know and assume you taught was with working with any sort of art media, so many teachers are so amazing in that space to do more project-based learning. So the students over multiple lessons are kind of enhancing one project. That's to me is the equivalent of using the grid method in a science classroom, an ELA yeah. classroom or a math classroom, because the students are able to begin right where they left off, continue throughout the process. And then it doesn't much matter if you get to them within the first 15 minutes, the first five minutes, first 20 minutes, you're able to give that authentic feedback the whole way through and you don't miss them when they need that moment. So love that note there. Uh, should we go to number five here? Absolutely. Number five, I'm throwing at you, encourage critical thinking and problem solving skills. <laughs> encourage critical thinking and problem solving skills. It says encourage critical yeah. thinking and problem solving skills. One to 10, 10 being the most important thing you have to do in the world. One yeah. being, eh, if you get to it, you get to it. Seven. I'm going to say seven. Okay. Okay. Tell me more. Uh, <laughs> I'm drawing a blank. Uh, <laughs> Is it bad that my first thought was like, oh, I don't know that I can say this on the show, but I was going to be like, no, not at all. I, I think I, I think like, where I'm stuck or where I'm equivocating is on the word encourage. 
Uh, and I was going to be like, damn, that's ballsy, Brad. Yeah. Just, <laughs> it, encouraging those, I mean, uh, to me, the, the, the critical thinking and problem solving skills is something that you embody as part of your regular interactions with, you know, both, you know, both uh, kids and your colleagues. <laughs> what <are> you <laughs> I can't focus on Dustin's comment. Dustin <laughs> just commented 12. That's the well, hell all done. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. It's a 12. Thanks, Dustin. Good job sticking to the rules. <laughs> where do you cut? Where do you land on uh, uh, where, uh, problem solving and uh, critical thinking? You know what? Everybody here in our crew, all of you are cheating because all of you are like eight and tens. Like there's no, no one said a two. I tried to throw in a two. I tried to give some variety. For me, this is going to be like, yeah, like a six, seven or eight. Like I really, 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 really need teachers to focus on it. But you have to. <laughs> to say that there's still things that are more important. And I think the purpose, or at least my intention for the purpose of this activity with us here was to say, hey, if everything's a 10, then we're gonna be drowning. And so I'm not trying to say things are not important, but you do have to have some sort of system to say, I can only work on one thing today. Is it going to be setting up a positive environment where students feel safe to learn? Is it going to be providing feedback to students in a timely manner? Is it going to be critical thinking? I'm not judging, but it can't be all of them because then we do none of them well until we have like a system and a routine to make it sustainable. Do you, do you mm. know what I mean? Like it sounds bad. No, I, I do. And I, I think no matter what we choose as a priority, making the priority explicit to the students that we serve is key. Uh, and so whether it's uh, intentional and you're putting it out front or whether you sort of have, a, have an aha teachable moment, you're, you're naming what is happening. And here's an awesome opportunity for us to dig into this particular skill, particular priority. Yeah, I agree. All right, friends, we have done one through five on our list. We have 40 of these statements. We would like 40. to use like two or three more Throw in the comments any number five through 40 that you'd like us to read. And then we will we will be reading those. Brad, that might be fun for us to post this after this live video is over. We can post this list of 40 and people can even bring this dialogue to their leadership teams or to their, you know, friends or whatever else. This could be a good drinking game. Let's be honest. Leave that with me. I'll make sure that the list of 40 gets posted. 38. There we go. We've got, so we've got the random numbers coming in. We've got 1138. I'll post a list of 40 in our Facebook comments after the show uh, as well. Yeah. Just before we forget, it's a loose thread. I want to make sure that we have an opportunity to post or reshare that uh, that bingo card as well. So leave yeah. that with me. We'll make sure those go into the Facebook comments. We've got okay. some numbers rolling in. What about number 11, Ray? All right, number 11. Let's kick off there. Number 11. So remember, 1 through 10, 10 being a 10 out of 10, the most important thing and every educator should be thinking of and establishing first, 1 being, and if you get to it, you get to it instill a love of learning in students. Uh, that's my 12. Uh, that's a 12 for me. It's just, it, <laughs> it's like breathing. I mean, it's, that's, that's, that's how we live life of educators. We, we model that love of learning, that discovery that, uh, wow. I mean, that's a 10, at least a 10 out of 10 for me. Uh, unfortunately, that's going to be a 10. That means I have three tens so far. I feel like we're breaking the rules we established. But it's interesting. I do think that depending on what you teach, there may not be this terrible feeling if it's not a 10 for you. Like I love one of our comments here, Brian's posting, and it's a four. I teach middle school math. Not all my students will love it. I really like that he's interpreting this for like instilling a love of math in students' lives. I actually agree with Brian. That actually in and of itself was not that important to me. What I did want them to value more was critical thinking and having a love for learning in general. So I, I like that he was specific because I do think that I can knock that down from a 10 to a four if I'm being specific to what I'm teaching day to day content wise. Did you find though that when you were employing the teach further model that kids found a way or you helped kids find a way for math to be meaningful, relevant, and and therefore impactful, and therefore instill or at least promote a love? The, of absolutely. I mean, wholeheartedly. I mean, the, the students that I can't even count on two hands that have gotten real world jobs and internships because of a sixth grade math class is yep. the pride of my life. I mean, truly. So yes, of course. But 
when we're talking about holistically all educators, I think that, again, that's a really, really great thing to be working towards if and when you have these higher numbers and set up. And I think that's important, again, while we're looking at this number system. What I what I will hope and, and what I, th I think all of us aspire to do is even if we're not certain that we are engendering that love of learning in each and every one of our students, we're certainly doing all we can to model our love for learning and our love for teaching the subject, the subjects that we're teaching. Maybe some of that love of the learning will just kind of rub off on our students. But if, if, if it's not evident that we are uh, enjoying, engaged, loving what we're doing, it's going to be really hard for, you know, for kids to see themselves as, as, uh, as loving the same thing that we do. So fun. Let's do two more, Brad. You got two more numbers over somewhere. I saw a lot. Yeah, of we've got 38, 38. Perfect. 38. Oh, so interesting. Okay. Friends, remember 10 out of 10, most important thing that teachers need to do one out of 10. Eh, if you get to it, that'd be great, but not the most important thing as an educator. 38, offer a variety of extracurricular activities. Oh, that's, that's true. Offer of, so I'm, <laughs> I'm going to say six. Uh, I'm going to say six, uh, and six is, uh, I saw it by your face. That's kind of low. No, but, but uh, like, this is the problem is like, yeah. do I believe all schools should offer a variety of extracurricular activities wholeheartedly? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do I think it's more important than engaging lessons or like, ugh, like, I think I'm going like four or five only because it has to be like after the learning uh maybe not maybe that's wrong it's so wrong that's so wrong here's where i landed i, I know that extracurricular activities depend on uh the time availability interest expertise but above all goodwill of the educators uh, and community members that support those programs and so i as a school leader i I want to give my staff explicit permission to dig into those extracurricular activities if and only if you have all of those available to you because our core purpose coming together is to instruct, lead, teach, and love learning among the kids in our classrooms. One of our user, one of our guests said, yeah, sometimes it's what gets kids to come and to stay in school, but above all, because it counts on the goodwill uh, and the available time uh, and un you know, frequently, very frequently unpaid time of our educators, yeah, we just have to keep those priorities in check uh, to make sure that people have a fair opportunity to dig in if and where it's part of their plate. Yeah, I really appreciate you noting all the pros and cons that unfortunately come with the educator lift on extracurriculars. That to me is like, yeah, extracurriculars, a variety, as long as everyone's paid for extra time and they also get a bonus in December. And whatever. But I will say, Brad, that it pains me to say this because even just the beginning of the show, we were talking about the things that we've gotten into that we love, that maybe were sparked from things we experienced in school and then took with us as adults. And I, my extracurriculars are what got me through where I am now. And it, that's a hard one that, that hurts my heart to even answer it. I'm taking back everything I said. I'm not answering this one. Well, the, uh, I guess the, the, the opportunity and the challenge for school leaders and, and districts and for, for faculties is to find ways if if we value those extracurricular activities and we know that our students do find ways to make it possible for our staff members and faculty members to uh to demonstrate leadership i mean we yeah we we all have both our personal and professional priorities that we have to respect and honor and I, for, for my money something is always better than nothing so even if it's something in a limited way we 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 know what we would love to we'd love to offer everything but if we can offer a taste rather than the whole buffet, to me, there's value out of there. Ooh, nitpicking at the word variety, Brad Hughes. That makes me more comfortable because I'm not okay. saying we shouldn't have any extracurriculars, but maybe we just tiptoe around the word variety. I do really value the comment uh, right here that says, for my school, this has decreased behavior issues, increased attendance, and student grades have increased. That's very, very, very important. We always want to strive to reach all students, no matter how we can get them started. So really cool things here, Brett. Do, is there one more that we could do on this list? Yeah. Uh, number 19, number 19. 19 it is. This will be a last one, but then friends, I promise that we will post this whole list in the stream for you. Feel free to use this activity. Might even be cool to bring this to your students and ask them to participate. Oh, this so good. 
so many good things here. So 19 is going to kill us all slowly. So I'm glad that we're ending with the with a really great one here, buddies. Um, number 19, Brad Hughes. Remember, 10 out of 10 is the most important thing you need to do as a teacher. And a one is, eh, if you get to it, you get to it. Number 19, foster a growth mindset. Uh, it's going to be a 10. It's going to be a 10. And I'm going to say 10 because it's manageable. It's not something that you have to, it's, it's something that anyway, it's something that I think all educators can embody, model, promote. And it, it again, it, it doesn't have to be the spotlight moment of each and every moment of, of your teaching, but fostering that growth mindset. It, let's like take a look at sort of the, the mistake of the day. And, and as an educator, you can say, Hey, there was my mistake of the day. Here's, here's what I learned. Just that, that can just be part of, you know, just, part of our everyday approach. I'm going to say 10. Okay. You and Dustin are stinking at this game because you both are finding as many loopholes as possible. Dustin's like, this is my 13. That's not even on the scale. Brad, you're right. Because this isn't a lift for teachers, this is just a mindset to adopt because this isn't a physical lift. I'll right. give you another 10. I agree. It's a 10. I did find one that may not be a 10. So can I just throw this one at our community before we wrap up this conversation? Absolutely. Okay. This one legitimately might be different for everyone. I want you to truly answer as needed. It's number 23. Maintain a visually appealing classroom. Oh. Now I will tell you, in my classroom, I really, really wanted it to feel comfortable. I wanted it to feel like you're walking into a living room, a kind of like a co-op space for us all to enjoy. There's a variety of flexible seating. I wrote a lot of grants to do that stuff. I'm kind of obsessed with seating. However, this to me is like a one or a two um, because visually appealing, I think it's so much more important to do all these other things. The physical space we learn in being appealing is not necessary in my opinion to me that's an extra to me that's like a a teacher choice like a for me i did it kind of because i had to be in the space all day and i wanted to enjoy the space <laughs> what are your thoughts like i don't know i feel bad i'm gonna i'm gonna say uh it's uh six uh and whoa. yeah and whoa um, you yeah. just went i was a one and you were a six yeah and here's here's what i'm thinking is that uh I like to see classrooms begin as a blank canvas and I like to see the visual appeal grow over the year as educators find ways to engage students in co-creating uh, the classroom environment. And I come back to my visual arts background. It's, it's like a blank canvas. And so if you add to the canvas over time, whether it's learning strategies or anchor charts, whether it's class celebrations or student photos, whether it's engaging students, families, it's, it's something that can be visually appealing, but also emotionally engaging altogether. Nope. Nope. I'm pushing back on this, Brad. I'm coming back. At, I'm coming for you, Brad. I agree. Having students contribute to the environment. Amazing. What if your students are terrible at art? They stink and you're teaching preschoolers and there's gross stuff that they create you still hang that up. It's not visually appealing, but it's meaningful. It's adding to the culture of your classroom, but it's not necessarily something that people would describe as visually appealing. Just because I have things up on my wall doesn't make it visually appealing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to push back on you too, because I think that, uh, uh, I guess the, the messiest, I mean, it's all evidence of student thinking and creation. So all of it to me has appeal. Now, wh whether it's visually appealing, that's all in the eye of the beholder. I mean, I, there, there's some, some preschool arts uh, and some preschool, uh, you know, I'm thinking of our, our preschoolers and kindergarten students who are beginning to write their, their first attempts at writing and getting ideas down on paper. It may not be fully formed. Their, their, their drawings may not be, uh, certainly worthy of hanging in our gallery, but it doesn't matter. What what matters is the evidence of student creation, uh, and that to me is one of the most beautiful things. Visual appeal to the max. I'm gonna I'm gonna bump my score from a six to a seven. <laughs> Whoever made this game was stupid. I hate this activity, and I'm never <laughs> playing again. <laughs> oh my gosh, friends! We'll be back for our Sunday spark. I quit. I quit. <laughs>
back to a Sunday weekly warm up. This has been both my favorite episode and my least favorite episode that we have ever done together. Brad Hughes in the house, bringing you your Sunday spark before we wrap up this conversation. Sunday spark. This this just warmed my heart. And on the screen, you can, you can just see one of the coolest things you could ever experience. This is on a flight where uh, a little one was in need of comfort, and uh, not only did uh, guests and passengers on the plane. Uh, engage with this little one uh, named Romy taking her first ever flight during that flight one of the passengers became uh, sorry, Romy became fascinated with one of the passengers uh next to her on the plane and and by the time the flight had landed that passenger had secretly crocheted Romy a beanie you can see Romy with that there and and uh mom's giving a shout out to uh Megan the passenger who crocheted that and to me, it just speaks to the power of, I just, it's, it's just so it's, it's just so wholesome. I just, I just love that, you know, it's, a, you're on a plane and you're, you're, you're in, you're, you're in a giant plane for this, you know, duration of the flight for better and for worse. And it just speaks to me about just uh, the individual power to make a difference and to make a memory uh, for a little one in a family. And it's all based on love. And it's also based on, you know, the, the, the passenger, leveraging her talents for crochet to say i'm going to make a difference to this child this family this moment this flight uh by creating something meaningful and original i just as as someone with a creator's heart but also as someone with a passion for uh connection and that i just just warn my heart i'll make sure i save a link to that in our comments I love it. We're going to have so many comments to post after this show. So much content to share with all of you that hopefully you can not only hopefully benefit or get a little giggle out of, but also share with others. So again, you too can give back and continue to add to this field in a positive way. Friends, thank you so much for joining us for our Sunday weekly warm up. I know we did not have a guest this week, but Brad and I loved being able to do a little activity here with our family and you know, catch up with all of you. And we're very excited to bring a guest on as soon as next week to be a part of our Teach Better family. Brad, thank you so much for doing this. This was just so fun to goof off and have a little bit of educational banter, even though I didn't like the activity. <laughs> I thought the activity was a home run. I, I'm so glad that you uh, provided and we were able to to, to, to share ideas around, uh, you know, that that top four in education. So much engagement. I want to express appreciation to everyone watching and listening live tonight. So much engagement, uh, not only, uh, you know, in, in the comments, but, uh, you know, getting a window into what we value as educators is so meaningful to, to me and to Ray. So thanks for uh, digging in with us tonight on this Sunday weekly warm up. Yeah. And Brad, I especially love the engagement where people just truly answered, even if it was against the norm. I loved seeing the variety of numbers and the descriptions on that. That's a huge part of our community here. We don't just want you to be a yes person and move on. We want to hear from you. And I love the activity. So thank you, Brad, for mentioning that. That was probably my favorite part of the, of the dialogue we were able to have. Hopefully we're able to have that in the future on future Sunday weekly warm up shows. We hope you have an amazing week ahead and friends, please let us know if we can do anything. Our teach better team is always here for you. And yes, even the one and only Brad Hughes that we all want to be best friends with. He might even respond to your direct messages if he needs something. 100%. Bye friends. We'll see you soon. Thank you.